if you have your Bibles, we are in a new book this Sunday. Book of Galatians. Turn your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 1. We are out of the book of Judges. It was enjoyable, it was interesting, it was harsh, but honestly, guys, I'm glad we're back into the New Testament. So, New Testament, into the book of Galatians, chapter 1, and today, my goal is to make everybody angry. No, I'm just, I'm messing. Uh, It will, we will be touching on some interesting subjects today, and I probably won't make everyone happy in the room, but that's all right. Um, I'm here to be as faithful to the text as possible. And so while we jump into the book of Galatians, this is a letter from the Apostle Paul as the early church was starting in those first 100 years. And the group of churches in Galatians were given this letter first, and then it was passed around to all the different churches in all the different countries early on in Christianity as something to help all of them out. So as we begin, let's begin in verse 1 of Galatians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him up from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, so Paul started this letter out to the Galatians, and as he did, he described himself as an apostle. Now, there's actually, the apostle, the word apostle itself can be used in a couple different ways. And I want to kind of really describe exactly what's happening here. So, at its root, the word apostle means sent one. Now, people are sent all the time into different jobs. You know, when your spouse sends you to the store to get some milk, you're technically an apostle for milk at that point. But when it comes to Christianity and religion, what does it mean? Right when, when Jesus was on the mount as he was leaving his 12 disciples, he commissioned them with that great commission in Matthew 28, and he essentially made all of his disciples at that moment to be apostles into all the world. So in one sense, we are all apostles. And that, in, in that sense, we are all sent out into the world. You see, when we became Christians and when we became Christ followers and disciples of Jesus, that doesn't mean we just hole up inside our house and wait till the end of the world. Or when we become you know, born again, we don't just get zapped up to heaven. No, we are here on the earth with a mission from Jesus to do and to love the world, to love our enemies, and to love our neighbors. So we are sent into this world. We are sent to the year 2022 to Milwaukee and to all the people we meet on a weekly and daily basis. So in that sense, we are apostles. But there are some other senses in which the word apostle are used, is used. Namely, to start churches, right? In in the scriptures, we see this idea That even someone like Paul, after he was persecuting Christians and killing Christians left and right, he met Jesus on the road to kill more Christians. And Jesus said, you know, stop what you're doing. Come follow me. And he did. And he was blinded. And and God saved him. and, And God did a mighty work in his heart and changed him. And now, after working at the church of Antioch for years and meeting the different uh, disciples and the apostles, God sent him and Barnabas out to start a bunch of churches. And then, of course, he got imprisoned. And while he was in prison, he was writing this letter to the churches that he helped start. And so they knew what the the word apostle meant. That it was someone who was sent to start churches. Interestingly enough, as we look at this passage, though, he qualifies what it meant for him to be an apostle. That it was not from men that he was an apostle. That it was not through man. Like, his authority did not come from men. He didn't get uh, Peter and, you know, John's stamp of approval, who are looked at as some of the other leaders in the early church, you know. Um, Peter is looked at as, uh, through many, as the first pope or one of the leaders in the church. John led the first council in Acts chapter 15. 
And there's lots of different passages. But, you know, while he met them and talked with them and they realized that grace and power was given to Paul, he did not get his authority from men. He got his authority from God, from Jesus himself. And so he was saying, I'm an apostle, not because of what the other disciples and the apostles think, but because of what Jesus did for me and what and why, because he sent me. So there's no bishop or council that gave him authority. It came directly from God. And I love how he starts this. He starts this with a declaration of who Jesus is. You know, Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Jesus is raised from the dead, and all the Christians believe that at this point. And then, as he's talking to the church, he says in verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. Right, so he's setting the stage for his entire letter. This is kind of like, you know how when you, when you write people messages, honestly, most of the time nowadays, we just text or Facebook message or Instagram message people. There's lots of different other ways in which many people don't write snail mail letters anymore, but this is how he did back in the day. So he started it by saying, grace and peace. He's saying, I love you guys. I want peace for you guys. I want the best for you guys. Even with all of the problems that are going on in this present age, what were the problems in their age? They were going through persecution. Guess what? The Roman Empire was not a big fan of early Christianity. Christianity would go in and they would preach against all these false gods and they would many times bankrupt a lot of industries that were formulating around making different gods and different, you know, stuff like that. And so lots of people were not happy with it. They were running Paul out of most of the towns that he was going into. And so he was talking to them. And I love it because even though he described their present evil age as an evil age, right? It, he wasn't, he didn't have like a downer attitude. He didn't have a defeatist attitude about it. He knew that the world and the time in which he lived was evil, and yet he was not captive to that idea. He was not on the defensive. He was, in fact, on the offensive. Why? Because he was sent, he was an apostle from Jesus. So, as he's starting out this letter and describing who he is and what he is and, and, and how he, you know, he's talking to all the different churches in this region of Galatia, which is essentially like a state or a province in Asia Minor, which is now Turkey. He's talking to these churches and he's saying, I love you guys, but I've got some stuff to say to you. So starts out really quick now in verse 6. He jumps in to the hard part. So he starts nicely, and then he gets to the harsher stuff. So what does he say? Verse 6, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but... There are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you receive, let him be accursed. He said it twice. For now, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. All right, so, so Paul is now jumping right into the issue, which is what's happening at many of the churches in Galatia. He's saying, guys, why are you believing these fake gospels, these false gospels? Why are you listening to them? Why are you so quickly deserting? And it's interesting because in verse 6, we see that it's happening quickly to these people who just saw the miracles of God lived through the life of Paul and the other apostles. You would think if anyone would not desert Jesus, it would be those who saw the miracles of the apostle Paul, right? 
or, or the other apostles who weren't that far away from them. But it happened quickly. And honestly, guys, that's, that is a huge admonition, not to the people outside the walls of this church, but to each and every one of our hearts that each and every one of us can so quickly leave the gospel of Jesus on even a daily basis. What does that mean? It means that, you know, when I wake up and I choose to live my day in a certain way, sometimes choosing it and sometimes not even thinking about it and just going about my day, and when I do that, I'm actually choosing a type of gospel as well. But when that happens, our hearts can very easily be turned away, very quickly be turned away from the gospel of the grace of Jesus to a different gospel. We are all susceptible. None of us are ironclad. None of us are completely immune to this problem that is happening in Galatia. I also like how he um, qualifies, how he describes the different gospel. He says, you know, our turning to a different gospel in verse 6, verse 7, not that there is another one. What does he mean by that? You see, there are lots of different ideas and good news in good news in this life, that's plural, that aren't actually good. They, they look like they're good. They feel like they're good. They may seem like they're good. Other people may describe other good news out there, but it's not truly good at the end of the day. In objective truth, when put against the gospel, it is not true good news. And in verse 7, we also see that there are actively people that are distorting the gospel. That there are actively people who are causing trouble. And this is why it's honestly not a bad thing to point out, hey, this person is a false teacher. Hey, this person is teaching a wrong gospel. Because that helps us to know who to stay away from when we watch a YouTube clip or when we see something online for us to be aware and to discern correctly, to know that there are some people in every age and every time and in many different churches that teach different gospels and they distort the gospel and cause trouble, as it says in verse 7. At the end of the day, though, this is a serious issue. It's not... It's not just something we can say, you know, Fred, it's not that big of a deal, right? It's, okay, so some people are a little off here and there. Fred, it's not that, you know, many times we try to mitigate. We try to minimize the seriousness of issues like this. And I get it. I do a lot of the same times many times. I, when, I, when I see something off or when I see, uh, you know, a little, the gospel twisted just a little bit, I'm like, oh, it's not that bad. Paul directed by God the Holy Spirit, gave a double curse to whoever does this. That's why it's serious, right? Like, apparently to God, it's very important for us not to take away anything from the gospel or to add anything to the gospel. So much so that he wrote in verse 8 and 9, two curses, essentially the same curse twice, meaning when you do something twice, it's really, really bad and important. So if anyone's twisting the gospel, it's a huge issue, not just to Paul, but to God who is speaking through Paul, which is why God made this serious pronouncement. So this is a, this is a real problem. And guess what? It's, it's honestly not always just from man. There is a spiritual side to this world in which we live in that we don't always like to look at. And hear the scriptures from God's point of view because he sees everything. He's peeling back the curtain for us to look into the spiritual realm and see, hey, there are actual ancient demons and fallen angels who are at work in this world trying to distort the gospel and twist it. Because some of the best deceptions are filled mostly with a lot of truth. And the devil and the fallen angels know that they can trick many people in the church and outside of the church. Back in the days of Galatia and the churches of Galatia and also in 2022 in Milwaukee, churches 
And people, Christians that go to them, are susceptible to quickly turning away to distortions of gospels made by man and fallen angels. The serious thing. And I love how Paul kind of sums it up in verse 10. He says, guys, you know, if I'm going to be truth, if I'm going to be true about this, it, it goes down to one thing. Either at the end of the day, I'm here to please God or I'm here to please man. If I'm here to please man, I'm going to, you know, do, do whatever makes you happy. Do whatever you guys approve of. But he says, that's not the case. I'm not here to please man. Because if I was pleasing man, I'm not a servant of God. I'm not a slave of Jesus Christ who bought me with his own blood. So Paul, in showing that he is a slave, a servant of Jesus Christ, says, no, the approval of man is actually an issue. If you live, if you live for the approval of your coworkers and your boss and your spouse and other teachers with other ideas that are not biblical, then you are living for the approval of man and not the approval of God. And guys, this is one of the hardest things that I think we all will struggle with till the day we die because many of us have inside of us this idea, this, this attitude, this mindset, these emotions that say, be a man pleaser. Get along with them. It's okay. And there's a part of it inside me as well. And I've had to struggle with this my entire life. That when any person, myself included, other pastors of this church included, if any of us says things that are contrary to the word of God, I have to ask myself, at that juncture, am I here to please them or am I here to please God? If I'm a servant of God, if I'm a servant of Christ... I should, like the book of Acts says, be a Berean, someone who checks whether or not these things are actually so, if these things are actually biblical and true and good, or if they are a twisted perversion of the gospel. This is a serious matter. Paul did not pull a punch within the first 10 verses of the book of Galatians. He came out swinging pretty seriously. Because why? The Galatians... Were his baby. They were a bunch of churches in a bunch of different towns in this little region that he had just started. And now he's trying to write a letter to them to help them to change to be back to the regular, real gospel of Jesus Christ. Not a twisted perversion of it. Now, specifically in their day, they were dealing with a gospel known as Gnosticism, where Gnosticism was a worldview in general that said the spirit is good. Everything that's spiritual is good. Everything that's fleshly is bad. And what happened is that gospel leaked into early Christianity, and it made a form of quasi-Gnostic gospel type of a Christianity, where they would say things like, God saved you, and he wants you to uh, like he wants you to be so um looking down on things of this world that fleshly desires like marriage is not good or eating good food is not an okay thing and, and they were all about trying to fast as much as possible they were all about all these things and they, they would keep saying things like oh Everything about the spirit is good, but everything about the flesh is bad. The problem with that is what? God created the world. God created our flesh. And he said we are good. And he said the gifts of this life that he's given us, like food and drink, are good things. Now, yes, the kingdom of God is different. It's not of this world, right? But the problem is, is this not this Gnostic gospel crept in to the early church and started to change things. And we'll see as we go throughout the chapters, what are some specific issues that this Gnostic gospel led to? The problem is, is it doesn't seem so bad because there are a lot of partial truths in the Gnostic gospel where the spirit is good. And there are some things about the flesh that are bad, but it's not always the case. And that's where the rubber meets the road. And the problem is, is when you grab onto a, a gospel like that, an idea like that, that's twisted, that's not from God, is it ends up years later and even sometimes really quickly distorting and perverting your life and an entire church and an entire region. 
And this is why I believe it's actually very important for us to look at today different fake gospels. Many of them claim themselves as good news, but they're not. So let's go over a couple of them today. Number one, I want to look at gospel plus works. There's a gospel out there, and it's actually pretty similar to Gnosticism, where it says you have to be good. Don't be bad. You have to um, be very strict with everything that you do in this life. There's lots of different rules in this type of a gospel, and many of the churches that follow gospel plus works There's lots of control about how you dress and what translation you use in the Bible. And and there's all these different rules that are extra biblical. And it's adding on to the gospel. And and the idea is, is yes, you get saved from Jesus' death on the cross, but it's Jesus' death on the cross plus your good works. And the Bible says, no, it's not. Yes, are you supposed to do good works? A hundred percent but as an outflowing of the grace given to you by Jesus. It's not works plus the gospel of grace that gets you into heaven as a follower of Jesus. It's just the gospel. It's just the grace of Jesus dying on the cross. And this is one of the many different gospels out there in the world today. You see, we live in America, 2022, and we're a melting pot of nations and ideas. And so it's not actually untoward for us to deal with 10 different gospels in one week. What's another one? A much hated gospel in the Reformed and even in um, the charismatic circles uh, is the prosperity gospel. It's something where it's very easy to pick on them. Rightly so. They are off. When you hear someone preach the prosperity gospel that Jesus died on the cross to make you, to make you happy, healthy, and rich, that's incorrect. That's wrong. That's a perversion of the gospel. Now, does God want you to be happy? Does God want you to be healthy? Does God want you to be rich? Possibly so, but as a byproduct, not the prime product of Jesus. Many times, in fact, God wants us to suffer, to be purified like gold made through a furnace. And he does that on purpose like he did to Job. He allows many bad things to happen in our life like job loss, marriage issues, money issues. So many things happen in our lives. And when you have the prosperity gospel as your mindset, how does that go wrong? There's so many ways in which that goes wrong. Because one of the ways in which that goes wrong is, you know, if your life isn't going well, if it's not going extremely, you know, happy all the time and healthy all the time, and you're not rich all the time, then you're thinking to myself, am I really saved? Am I really a Christian? Because if I was a Christian, I would have these things. And you, you start to doubt the gospel. You start to doubt the true gospel of Jesus and his free grace given to us. Prosperity gospel is a perversion. It has some partial truths in it. They use many different verses in the scripture, but at the end of the day, it is a false gospel and worthy of the double curse given to it in verses before. There's another one called the self-help gospel. This is where they kind of view yourselves as not really a sinner. They say, hey, be your best version of yourself. Let's give you three steps to get out of debt. There's not really, it's not really sin. Everything's gray. Everything's mushy. We're here to make you feel better. And it's a bunch of soft soap, as C.S. Lewis calls it. Self-help gospel is out there. And many churches can have it. And many good churches can have a version of it. Jesus didn't come on the cross and didn't come down to die on the cross or come to this world to help us be a better version of ourself. No, he came to make dead people come alive spiritually. He came to make us be born again by the Spirit of God, not just for us to be a little bit different version of Fred, a better version, typically a, a richer, more healthy, and happy version of myself. So it's actually very similar to the prosperity gospel. This is not why Jesus came, and it's a perversion of the gospel. What's another one? One that I like to call Wonder Gospel. I made that up. Um, 
The idea behind that is, is that you are only truly saved if you can do miracles. If you have enough faith, you can heal anyone. And as a Christian, you should be able to do that. And if you can't heal people, if you can't do miracles, you're not a Christian. People may think, oh, I've never heard of that. If you've never heard of that, there's a large movement within Christianity where that's the case. And the problem is, is you know, I, I didn't think that was necessarily a gospel thing, but they directly tie it to salvation. And I've had and seen many people in it that have doubted their salvation because they couldn't do a miracle. They didn't have faith enough to heal cancer or some issues. I've seen it. Where people said, if you're a Christian, if you truly have faith, you will be healed of your disease. You will be healed of your issues. The problem is that sometimes God desires for your time to be up. The Bible nowhere claims that everyone who becomes saved will have miraculous powers and will have faith to heal every issue. Yes, did Jesus come to die on the cross? And as Isaiah 53 says, to heal us with his stripes, there is a healing. And there is a deep spiritual side to that healing of the sin within our heart. Did Jesus come and and to give us the gift of the Holy Spirit, which many times provides miraculous gifts and healing faith? Yes, sometimes, but not all the time. We believe that there are gifts that are miraculous, like healing, like miracles, but not all of us have it. It's up to the Spirit whom he gives those types of miraculous gifts to. It's not a salvation thing. And if you don't have enough faith to heal yourself or others, you can still be a Christian. And if you believe this wonder gospel of miracles equaling truly saved, that's a false gospel today. Problem is, is many times people are so bound up in seeking these miraculous gifts that they forget to seek the giver of the gifts, Jesus Christ himself. And that is the true gospel. Then there's the political gospel. Everyone's got a side on this, right? There's the Republican gospel, there's the Democrat gospel, and there's the third-party gospel. When Jesus came to start his kingdom, he said, my kingdom's not of this world. America is not God's chosen land to do God's will in this world. Now, may, God may use America in different ways, in different wars, in different times, but guess what? God's okay if America's not around. God's got it. If the Democrats or the Republicans don't win, God's still in control. His kingdom is greater than our political party. Jesus didn't die on the cross to make our party victorious. Doesn't mean politics aren't important. I'm not saying don't be involved, don't vote. I am saying, though, that as a Christian, your political identity should not be your gospel. That ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a false gospel if that takes the primary part in your life. And if you only preach that gospel, God, in his infinite wisdom, did not come down and did not have Jesus come down to start a political kingdom. He had Jesus come down to die to start a spiritual kingdom in our hearts. And that is what Jesus is all about, not the political gospel. There's another gospel, social justice gospel. It's to end systemic racism, systemic violence, marginalization. At the end of the day, some of those things aren't bad, right? Racism is a sin. It should be eradicated as much as possible. 